why do you enjoy watching birds? I think it's a good reason to get out in nature on beautiful days or sometimes not so beautiful days. <laughs> and uh, I think it's just interesting when you can watch the moon. We just saw a great blue heron and we were both <laughs> like their feet were so neat just how they move and he was walking and it's just really interesting to see how other creatures move around and I think it's great. Hello, welcome to BirdWise for December 2007. This is the last edition of BirdWise. Thanks for having joined us for the past two years. In addition to our regular features, the news, calendar, and feather report, we'll hear about birder behavior, we'll listen to various people speak of their favorite birds, we'll visit the William Cannon Trail, but first, a bird from our sponsor. This month, we wish to deviate from our usual avian salute and celebrate instead you, the bird watchers in our audience. Our show has attempted to offer you information on various ways to enjoy birds. To those who simply enjoy your backyard birds, we offer a toast. May the chickadees bring a smile to your face and the juncos put a hop in your step. Do you prefer sharing your bird watching experiences with a friend? Wonderful, learning together is rewarding in many ways. For the gregarious folks who flock up for field trips, may the highways be clear and the flyways be filled. And a bit of advice, bad weather means good birds. If you like contributing your newfound skills to science, thank you, we need you. Basic avian research such as monitoring bird populations or behaviors is fascinating. Your efforts are applauded. Do you look forward to the challenges of building a list of birds you've seen? Congratulations for every milestone you reach. Each life bird is a memory of places, people, and events. Birds are everywhere, and I cannot imagine going somewhere without anticipating new sightings and new songs. And we thank the seasoned and budding ornithologists in our audience. We all benefit from your efforts to unravel the mysteries of the bird's world. Our crew member, Vicki Adams, went to the Nisqually Refuge recently and asked people what their favorite birds are. I'm interested in hearing what this is about. Uh, my favorite bird, um, I can't say that I actually have a favorite bird. We don't have a favorite bird, <laughs> to be honest with you. We, you know. All birds to us are really Yeah, I guess you could say all of our birds yeah, are favorites. Like Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Well, my favorite bird's the common grebe. I, I have too many favorites. Uh, uh, I, I really like the black cap chickadee, but I saw a lot of um, cedar waxwings today, and they're becoming a favorite? They're pretty good too. Mm -hmm. Chickadees. Well, and hummingbirds, they're, you know, they're easy. Well, I have several favorite birds. I would say probably the marsh wren. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like a lot of them too. It's always nice to see the, uh, the usual characters, but uh, great blue heron and uh, green herons are, are favorites. I like American kestrels. I guess the robin is. I like the song that they have in the mornings. Oh, I think the bald eagles that nest out here. We saw some this spring. Don't see them right now, but they probably are here looking at us. My favorite bird are 
golden and bald eagles. I think I like them all, but I like owls the best. My favorite bird is a barn swallow. We were just talking about that because I love old barns probably even more than birds. <laughs> and they're beautiful and graceful. Uh, my favorite bird is the whooping will because I, um, growing up in southern Indiana, always heard the whooping will in the backyard and I just loved it when I was camping at home and things. My favorite bird is the cardinal. We're from Missouri and as a child I remember seeing bird quite often so it became my favorite bird to watch. That's very hard to describe because there's lots. Um, I wish we had cardinals out here. Uh, bald eagles, uh, Cooper's hawk, all the warblers. Let's go now to Bert and hear about his travels recently and his observations of birder behavior. Hi. I may have mentioned once on this program that several years ago I was down at High Island, Texas watching the spring migration. That, that year the, word, the woods were full of British birders. And as I listened to them very excitedly talking about all the birds they were seeing, it was obvious that they were very well prepared for seeing birds in North America. And I mentioned this to one of them and he said, did you think we'd come all this way without being prepared for the birds we might see? Well, I suppressed the temptation to say that I was afraid that a lot of North American birders would not prepare in the same way for a trip to Europe. And I recently had an opportunity to check that because in September I went on a trip to Spain for about 11 days of birding was a, a trip sponsored by the American Birding Association. And there were nine of us Americans, and I thought it would be interesting to reflect a little bit on my fellow birders, since that's what we're talking about this month. Of course, I, being a very virtuous person, had prepared myself in exactly the way I recommended. That is, I had my books on the birds of Europe, and I had carefully studied these books to prepare myself for all the different kinds of birds that I might see in Europe. But it was interesting to see whether the, the other North Americans, the other Americans that were there in Spain had prepared in the same way. Now there, was, there were a couple, Charlie and Ruth, who uh, had traveled all over the world. And Charlie had a life list of about 4,000 species, which is pretty impressive when you consider that there are about 10,000 species of birds in the entire world. And I don't know whether Charlie had prepared, but Charlie was really an expert birder. He was the kind of guy who had wonderful eyes. And in the half a second that you can see a bird as it flashes around from one place in the bush to another, Charlie was able to see all of these birds and see all of their characteristics and identify them right away. He was really very good. And as I say, he had a life list of about 4,000. His wife, Ruth, was very interesting. She had been with him all of this time, but Ruth had absolutely no interest in keeping a life list. I asked her what interested her about birding, and she said she liked to find the birds. She, had, she liked to find the birds lurking in the bush. And of course, I'm sure she identified them. She was interested in that. But when it came to keeping a life list, she had no interest at all. Uh, I've talked on this program about the importance of learning to, to see all of the different parts of birds. And it was interesting, there was only one fellow, Richard, who very commonly would refer to those things when he was talking about the birds he had seen. He would say he had seen a bird with a white supercilium, or that he had seen a very clear median crown stripe on the, on the head. And it was very rare to hear anybody else say anything of that kind. Now, as I say, I had prepared myself by really studying the field guide so I knew what kind of birds I was likely to see. Uh, there was one woman who uh, watched all the birds. She took a lot of pictures of them. And uh, she made very careful field notes of all the birds she was, that we had seen. But it was, was as if, in many cases, she had never heard of the birds' names before. She kept asking us for the names and how to spell them and so on. And it was clear that she hadn't prepared in any way for that. 
She also didn't really know the categories that a lot of birds belong to. And one of the things I've tried to emphasize is that you should learn the different categories of birds, the families of birds, and know how to recognize birds as a family. Well, this was on the whole a very nice, interesting bunch of people. Uh, there was only one fellow who annoyed me, who had a habit that I think I should talk to you about. Um, he had been all over the world, too. He had a list, life list of about 2,000 birds. And he knew all of the etiquette of exactly how everybody should behave. For example, when they come to look at the spotting scope, just looking for a couple of seconds and moving on. But apparently nobody had ever taught him about getting in other people's sight lines. I mean, when you're with a bunch of other people and they're looking with their binoculars, and especially when a lot of them are looking through spotting scopes, one of the things you have to be very careful of is not getting in front of them, not walking in front of them and interrupting their observing. And this fellow apparently had never learned any of that. And it was very annoying that as we were standing around looking, he kept walking right in front of me and right in front of other people. Well, as I say, it was an interesting group of people. And as I say, they didn't all do the kind of things that I've been recommending in this program that people should really do in becoming birders. But um, I suggest you, get, you pick up your binoculars and go out and look at birds and also pay some attention to the birders around you. I mean, I've always found them to be really a very nice group and quite an interesting group of people. And I think you'll find it interesting also to get to know the people that you're birding with. Why do you enjoy watching birds? Started in college. Uh, my husband and I are both bird watchers and we took a course from Dr. Rample at Whitman and ironically he just passed away this when the Swifts came to town this spring. He was 97. We had seen him three days earlier. But he was the one who taught us and we started bird watching then and it's something to do when you're in the out of doors and it gets you in the out of doors. The holiday season is an excellent time to visit the Nisqually Nature Shop for that special gift for your young or experienced birder. All proceeds go to benefit the National Wildlife Refuge. A couple great gifts for kids. One is owl puke. It's an actual owl pellet that has been uh, picked up. It's been sterilized so it's safe for kids to uh, go through and see what an owl actually eats and they can pick through it and see what it eats and pull the skeleton out and become a wildlife biologist on their own. And they'll have hours of fun with it. Another great gift for kids is, is we have some birds animated, like this the woodpecker. Uh, great for kids, they love them. Uh, we also sell a lot to adults too. A couple of great pieces of artwork by David Kaner, uh, Olympia artist. This little pajaro packs that you can carry your water bottle and your bird guide with you while you're out birding. You also have some uh, very nice caps for sale here at the Nature Shop uh, with the Nisqually logo on them. The Nisqually Nature Shop is open Wednesday through Sunday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. What is it that you like about watching birds? Just the fact that they're uh, natural in their natural state, you know, watching them uh, take care of their families, watching them fly from tree to tree and interact with other birds and everything. It's just generally just watching what they do, them watching me maybe. Now let's go to Sheila McCartan with the news for December, our calendar and the feather report. Thanks Tom. Christmas bird counts top our news to this month. Whether you're a beginning or an advanced birder, Christmas bird counts are a fun way to learn more about our local birds. More than 50,000 observers across the country are expected to participate in this year's 108th Christmas bird count. The counts are an all-day census of early winter bird populations in a particular area. The results of the counts around the country are compiled into the longest running database in ornithology, representing over a century of unbroken data trends of early winter bird populations. Simply put, the Christmas bird count, or CBC, is citizen science in action. 
The primary objective of the CBC is to monitor the status and distribution of bird populations across the Western Hemisphere. The information is also important for conservation efforts. From feeder watchers and field observers to count compilers and regional editors, everyone who takes part in the CBC does it for the love of birds and the excitement of friendly competition, and with the knowledge that their efforts are making a difference for science and bird conservation. Anyone can participate in our local CBCs. Here's some information on two of them. The Olympia Christmas Bird Count will be held on Sunday, December 16th. The event is sponsored by Black Hills Audubon Society. Volunteers are needed to spend the entire day in the field counting birds in their group's assigned count area. This is a serious commitment and a whole lot of fun. The day will conclude with the traditional post-count chili feed shortly after dark at the Gull Harbor Lutheran Church. Almost every year, Olympia has the national high count for Golden Crown Kinglet and Winter Wren. To join this year's count, contact Susan Markey at 438-9048. The SATSUP CBC will be held on Wednesday, December 26th. This bird count covers the area between Elma and Montesano, north and south of the highway. It regularly tallies over 100 species and counters have found such rarities as Black Phoebe, Ruff, and Cinnamon Teal. Please contact Tom Schooley at schooleymccarton at comcast.net or 357-9170 for more information or to sign up. The upcoming field trips are all led by our own BirdWise staff. We hope you can come along on one or all of these field trips sponsored by Black Hills Audubon Society. On Sunday, January 27th from 9 a.m. to noon, join field trip leader and BirdWise educator Bert Gutman for Downtown Ducks Part 2. Bert will continue his exploration of the waters of downtown Olympia in search of ducks and other water birds and the passerines that inhabit the edges of the waterways. Olympia has been a wonderful spot for wintering ducks for many years. This field trip is designed for beginners, but anyone is welcome to attend. Meet at the Tumwater Historical Park at 9 a.m. and call the Black Hills Audubon Society office 352-7299 to register. On Sunday, January 20th, join field trip leader and BirdWise host Tom Schooley for a long day in the bird-rich areas in northern Snohomish County. The trip will start at the Stanwood Sewage Ponds looking for ducks and then travel along the shores of Port Susan Bay. This is a central gathering spot for thousands of snow geese, hundreds of trumpeter swans, and tens of ring-neck ducks. There are raptors galore and the blackberry piles are full of sparrows. It is possible to find upwards of 80 species with cooperative weather. Call Tom at 357-9170 to register. On Saturday, February 2nd, starting at 8.30 a.m., join field trip leader and BirdWise featherman Phil Kelly at Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. Phil will celebrate the end of hunting season and the reopening of the dike trail at the refuge. Winter visiting birds abound at this time of year and waterfowl are everywhere. Phil hopes to see the usual suspects and find any rarities that may be present. Enjoy the five and a half mile walk around the refuge or go as far as you would like and return on your own. Call Phil at 459-1499 to register. We'll end our report today with our feather report for January. Here's BirdWise featherman Phil Kelly. Go. Well, thank you, Sheila. Hi, folks. For the month of December 2007, the feather forecast is going to be very similar to the first feather forecast I gave you in January 2006. This being our last show, I thought I would recoup to a degree what we did when we initially started two years ago. The feather forecast for December of 2007 is going to be mostly ducky, hopefully with a little snow. By mostly ducky, I mean the winter waterfowl are going to be in, in force, mallards, pintail, northern shovelers, green-winged teal, uh, American widgeon, a Eurasian widgeon or two around. There will be lots of coots in the area. Uh, should be mergansers on the, on the salt water. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some snow geese in the area. Now, two years ago, 
in January of 06, we had some snow geese for sure at Nisqually Wildlife Refuge, and we also had some snowy owls. Well, the snowy owls were down here for, for that particular period, 2005, 2006, and have not come down from the Arctic this year and probably won't for a couple of years. But again, it's gonna be mostly ducky. Any place where there's water, there's gonna be lots of ducks around. You can get out and take a look and see some really good looking waterfowl. They've all, they're all in their best dress right now. They've molded in the fall after breeding season. So they're gonna be as sharp and as pretty as they're gonna be. So grab your binoculars, get your wet weather gear on, get out and get a little exercise, walk around Capitol Lake or Nisqually Wildlife Refuge and take a look at these ducks or the geese that happen to be in the area. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and thanks for a great run. Why do you enjoy watching birds? Oh, I, I have a bird feeder that hangs in my kitchen window and I think I watch them all day long as they flit in and out. And I also watch them early in the morning because there's, some, uh, there's a blue spruce tree right on the edge of our property and it's just a twitter with birds and they're now feeding off the cedar uh, droppings that have fallen on the roof. Tim and I visited a place close to Olympia where we found the William Cannon Trail. If you have ever marveled at the sublime beauty of Mud Bay while speeding along Highway 101, you might already know that there is a way for you to get even closer. Then again, it is quite possible you've never heard of the William Cannon Trail, which runs along Eld Inlet and is tucked behind a business park of storage units and security fences. The trail is named after the only American who was part of the Hudson's Bay Company expedition, which came through Eld Inlet way back in 1824. And while things have certainly changed since then, when you find yourself on the 4,000 feet of the William Cannon Trail, looking out over Mud Bay, it is easy to believe you have gone back in time. Just across the bay is McLean Point and Triple Creek Farm, two large expanses of bayfront property that have been preserved in their natural state through conservation easements acquired by the Capital Land Trust. This trail is a great spot for viewing shorebirds. On our visit recently, we caught this group of greater yellowlegs feeding in the mud. A heron rookery that was based along McLean Point has left, but you can still catch the occasional heron as well as salmon, river otter, and other wildlife. You can find the William Cannon Trail by turning onto Madrona Beach Road, right where Mud Bay Road hits Highway 101. Right after you pass the storage business, you'll see a small sign pointing into a parking lot. Go to the north end of the lot where there is a trailhead and kiosk. It may not look like much, but if you follow the trail to the water, you're in for a treat. So, hi, my name is Vicki Adams, and uh, I'm part of the crew of BirdWise. And, uh, okay, so my favorite bird. My favorite bird is the hummingbird, because uh, I love to watch them um, hover and do some of the things that other birds can't do. Okay. You're right, this is hard. <laughs> okay, and um, I like watching birds because, um, you know, the hustle and bustle of people and your daily existence, it takes you away from that and reminds you of uh, what's really important. It's been great doing BirdWise. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tim and all the cast. Bye. Bird watching is an opening to the world of nature. We hope BirdWise has helped open that door for you. Bert, Sheila, Phil, and I do thank you for having joined us for the past 24 months. And we truly thank Vicki Adams, Tim Sweeney, Devlin Sweeney, and the crew at TCTV for making this show possible. I'd like to circle back now to our opening missive from William Leon Dawson. Love of the birds is a natural passion and one which requires neither analysis nor defense. The birds live, we live, and life is sufficient answer unto life. They are here to add zest to the enjoyment of life itself, to please the eye by a display of graceful form and piquant color, to stir the depths of human emotion with their marvelous gift of song, to tease the imagination by their exhibitions of flight, or to goad aspiration as they seek in their migrations the mysterious, alluring, and ever insatiable beyond. Goodbye and good birding.
My name is Tim Sweeney. I'm the producer of Birdwise. My favorite bird is the kingfisher. I like its punk hairdo, its distinctive call, the crazy way it flies, and the fact that it's always fun to watch. Bird watching is a lot like meditation because when you're focusing on birds, you very much are living in that moment. You can view past episodes of Birdwise at www.birdwise.blogspot.com. Until then, grab your binoculars and happy birding. My name's Tim Sweeney, and I'm the producer of Birdwise. My favorite bird is the belted kingfisher. I like its punk hairdo, its crazy style of flying, the fact that it's always fun to watch, and that the more colorful kingfisher is the female. I think birdwatching is like meditation, because when I'm watching birds, I'm in that moment.